Welcome. It is uh, my great honor to welcome Professor Shayla Ben Habib uh, to deliver today the, the 2015 Martha C. Nussbaum Lecture. The idea for this lecture was initiated. Is this is this mic working okay? I'm not too close. Okay, was initiated at last year's meeting in Greece, and um, the intent is to honor Martha Nussbaum's role, both in helping to found the Human Development and Capabilities Association, and also her pioneering work on capabilities, which has been an intellectual inspiration to all of us. More generally, the lecture series is intended to reflect the important role of the humanities, particularly philosophy, in the work of the association, which, has, which sometimes might seem to focus somewhat more on economics. I can say that as an economist. The, the lecture series will ensure that a key plenary at our annual meeting will continue to highlight the importance of philosophy in bringing insights into efforts to, theor to theorize and enhance human flourishing, as so aptly demonstrated by Martha's work. I'm, I'm very pleased to announce that we are well on our way to making this lecture a sustainable feature of HDCA meetings. So uh, you will be able to look forward to uh, Martha Nussbaum lectures in the future at HDCA conferences. Our distinguished speaker today, Professor Sheila Ben Habib, is the Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale. From her birth in the cosmopolitan city of Istanbul into a family which traces itself back to the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, she has been immersed in, the is in issues of the shifting and porous boundaries of culture and the delicate nature of establishing universal human rights in a pluralistic world. Professor Ben Habib is an important philosopher whose work speaks directly to the issues that this association cares most, most deeply about. How can we ex enhance human flourishing in the context of human rights and democratic values? In the interest of time, I will keep my comments ex very brief, but I do want to highlight how her work brings together the best of several strands of thought, uniting, for example, the work of Habermas with uh, Kantian political philosophy and also bringing in important feminist um, insights from feminist thought. For example, she has persuasively argued that cultures are not monoliths and has pointed out the problems with uh, general appeals to culture. She has delved deeply into how cultures evolve in dialogue with other cultures and um, has brought cultural ideals into dialogue with ideas of pluralism and cosmopolitanism. In other work, she has written on such wide-ranging topics as the impact of globalization and the flow of migration on political sovereignty, particularly apt uh, at this moment. In her presidential address to the Eastern Division of the American Philosophical Association, she argued that an appropriately robust conception of human rights should be grounded on a funda fundamental moral right to have rights, arguing that without self-governance, human rights remain hollow. The work of Professor Ben Habib strongly demonstrates the importance of philosophy to human capabilities and how, at our peril, we would neglect it uh, for a more narrow focus. Today, Professor Ben Habib will speak to us on democratic iterations in cosmopolitan human rights, a new paradigm for the dialectic of law and politics. Please join me in welcoming her. Dear colleagues, uh, dear students, dear Martha, I'm honored uh, to have been invited to give uh, this uh, lecture in Martha Nussbaum's honor this afternoon. 
Uh, I will be talking to you actually quite a bit about law and legal developments, so maybe shifting the focus a little bit away from economics towards the legal sphere. I have a PowerPoint which is meant to accompany the lecture text, but I do have a text we philosophers have not yet given up the belief in the text and closely argued uh, production of uh, text. So um, the PowerPoint is just for the purposes of comprehension. Watching the unfolding refugee crisis in Europe, one has the impression of being caught in the archives of a bad World War II movie. Innocent people whose only crime is to escape death and persecution in their own land, uncomprehending state authorities repeating well-worn cliches, scenes of heartbreaking human tragedies with dead bodies in the back of meat trucks and dead infants in the arms of Greek, Turkish and Italian police. Borrowing a page from some of the worst memories of World War II and the Holocaust of European Jews, Czech officers print numbers on the arms of refugees with indelible ink, while Hungarian police and military outdo themselves to force unwilling refugees into camps, which bear monotonous resemblance to refugee camps elsewhere in the world, people held behind barbed wire often more fit for penning animals than human beings, and maybe not animals as well. This is by no means the first of the post-World War II refugee crises. One need only remember the tragedy of the boat people in the mid-70s after the cessation of hostilities in Vietnam and Cambodia, or the Haitian refugees sent to the Guantanamo camp by the Clinton administration in the 90s, or the refugees of the Yugoslav civil wars in Europe. The international system of states and its dysfunctionalities periodically produce refugees as a result of civil wars, military coups, and so-called humanitarian interventions. The refugee, the internally displaced person, the economic migrant, and the forced distinction between refugees and economic migrants with which states operate, all these categories of human beings have become symbols and metaphors of the paradoxes of a system which insists on state sovereignty while also declaiming universal human rights. In this lecture, I wish to place the refugee crisis in the context of a much broader contemporary discussion concerning the development of international law in our world and what I shall call the sovereigntist resistance to it. This new sovereigntism has produced strange bedfellows among conservative U.S. Supreme Court justices on the one hand and more liberal nationalists as well as progressive thinkers on the other. They all believe that the new international legal order threatens democratic sovereignty. I will argue that this is wrong and that transnational human rights strengthen rather than weakening dem democratic sovereignty. In the conclusion, I will return to the justified skepticism and cynicism many may feel about these developments in view of the inability of the current state system to address the refugee crisis, and I shall offer just a few thoughts for institutional reform. These topics are particularly well suited to honor Martha Nussbaum because much of her work has been dedicated to exploring moral and political cosmopolitanism based on her unique philosophy of an Aristotelian understanding of human capabilities. She has also been a pioneer in focusing on women's international human rights and in emphasizing how the transnational struggle for women's rights is at the heart of the cosmopolitan project. Just as she has argued that, quote, love of country is not incompatible with universalism and cosmopolitanism, so too I will argue that legal cosmopolitanism strengthens rather than weakening democratic popular sovereignty. Let me begin with the new sovereignism. A wide-ranging controversy has emerged that spans legal studies as well as political philosophy, jurisprudence as well as cultural studies. 
This controversy concerns at its deepest level the meaning of democratic and popular sovereignty in a new age and under conditions of nascent legal cosmopolitanism. We can distinguish among several questions. First, what is the status of foreign law, including the law of other nations and international treaties in constitutional and statutory adjudication? As we know, great variations exist among, across countries in this regard. While international law becomes part of the valid constitutional order in many countries of the world, such as Netherlands and South Africa, other constitutions are dualist as opposed to constitutional monism and with, uh, are dualist with respect to treaty-based international law and require various forms of treaty ratification before these can become part of the law of the land, such as the case with the United States, for example. A second question is whether recent developments in legal doctrine and practice can be seen as leading toward global constitutionalism. Global constitutionalists point to increasing cooperation among constitutional court justices across the globe, their learning from one another, and increasingly their citing one another in similar cases, not necessarily as precedent, but as significant evidence. Even scholars such as Jeremy Waldron, who find the concept of global constitutionalism exaggerated, nonetheless argue that there is increasing convergence around, quote, a law for all nations. In reaction to these developments, a group of scholars, intellectuals, and policymakers who view the emerging international legal order and with consternation have now coalesced as the new sovereigntists. The new sovereigntists have met the utopian claims of legal cosmopolitans and global constitutionalists with skepticism bordering on hostility, and here strange bedfellows have emerged, and right and left advocates of sovereignism have joined hands in their criticism of international law. Leading the conservative attack on international law have been some judges of the U.S. Supreme Court and their supporters in the U.S. Congress. The matter of the citation of foreign law, whether the law of other nations or international law and treaties, has now become an American political scandal on. It serves as a litmus test in the appointment of Supreme Court justices who are asked whether or not they will interpret the US Constitution in the light of foreign doctrine or influence. As Justice Scalia states these objections, and this is up on the screen, quote, the court should either profess its willingness to reconsider all these matters in the light of views of foreigners or else it should cease putting forth foreigners' views as part of the reasoned basis of its decision. To invoke alien law when it agrees with one's own thinking and ignore it otherwise is not reasoned decision-making, but sophistry." End of quote. Justice Scalia made this critique in the context of a decision striking down the death penalty for juvenile offenders who were younger than 18 when they committed the crime. Justice Kennedy, who wrote, for the majority of the, who wrote for the majority, cited the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, among other documents. For some, this sovereignism of the U.S. court is nothing new. They have called it American exceptionalism, mutating into American exemptionalism. These are Michael Ignatieff's words. However, the United States Supreme Court's militant understanding of sovereignist territorialism as commitment to territoriality in national politics and resistance to committee or international law is not an isolated phenomenon and has spread to other countries as well. Rather than indicating American exceptionalism, it may be more appropriate to see the sovereignism as part of a growing resistance to the force of international law in our world. In the European context, this is manifesting itself as a resistance to the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, in the United Kingdom in particular. The Guardian newspaper recently reported that Michael Grove, 
The new Justice Secretary has plans which would see the Human Rights Act, which incorporates the European Convention on Human Rights into British law, will be replaced by a British Bill of Rights and that the European Court of Human Rights would no longer be binding over the UK's Supreme Court. Now, the new sovereignism is not only advocated by conservative governments and judges on both sides of the Atlantic. Sharing the critique of international law are a group of eminent political thinkers, ranging from communitarians such as Michael Walzer, to liberals such as Thomas Nagel, and to progressive left thinkers such as Samuel Moyne and Jean Cohen. These thinkers single out principally the values of democratic sovereignty and self-determination and claim that recent developments in international law are A, ideals of cosmopolitan elites with little traction in the life of peoples, was and Moyne, that international law is no more than the consensually undertaking contractual commitments of sovereign states who remain the central units of jurisdiction and enforcement, an argument made by Thomas Nagel, and see that the principle of self-determination expresses an important value and that legal pluralism may be the desirable middle ground between cosmopolitanism and national sovereignty. I take these objections, and particularly A and C, very seriously. In this lecture, I'm interested in legal cosmopolitanism as it bears on the individual as a legal person in the international community, and I wish to examine the alleged conflict between one class of international human rights norms in particular, namely those pertaining to human rights broadly understood, and democratic sovereignty. Focusing on human rights norms is important because there is wide-ranging consensus among global constitutionalists such as Jürgen Habermas, as well as liberal nationalists such as Thomas Nagel, that these constitute the sine qua non of the legitimacy of any order of international law. Nonetheless, little attention has been paid to conflicts among different interpretations and execution of human rights norms even among liberal constitutional democracies. Instead, in the wake of the discussion introduced by John Rawls's The Law of Peoples, scholarly attention has focused largely on the lack of subscription to or compliance with international human rights norms in so-called decent hierarchical regimes as opposed to liberal constitutional ones. I will argue that transnational human rights norms strengthen rather than weaken democratic sovereignty. My thesis will be that this is a false juxtaposition and that even though there is inevitable conflict and tension between the application of human rights norms in domestic contexts and the stipulations of international covenants and treaties, we need to develop an important conceptual model for understanding these tensions, not as a zero-sum game, but rather as a process of dialectical norm enhancement and interpretation. A brief conceptual clarification. I prefer the term transnational human rights to the more common usage of international human rights, though at times I will use them interchangeably. International human rights appear to privilege a state-centered focus, the agents of international law are states, whereas transnational human rights, as my colleague Harold Coe defines them, refers both to public and private, statal and non-statal forms of law and rights litigation that are engaged with conversations across state boundaries. And that's what will be my focus. So let me begin by what I'm calling the legal cosmopolitan order of the post-World War II period. And forgive me, I have to get oh, the order is here. Okay. Since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, we have entered a phase in the evolution of global civil society, which is characterized by the rise, we might say, of cosmopolitan norms of justice. By cosmopolitanism, like Martha Nussbaum, I have in mind both a moral and a legal proposition. 
Morally, the cosmopolitan tradition is committed to viewing each individual as equally entitled to moral respect and concern. Legally, cosmopolitanism considers each individual as a legal person entitled to the protection of their human rights in virtue of their moral personality alone and not on account of their citizenship or membership status. Even if cosmopolitan norms also originate through treaty-like obligations, such as the UN Charter, the UDHR, and various other human rights covenants, their peculiarity is that they bind signatory states and their representatives to treat citizens and residents in accordance with certain norms, even when states later wish, as is often the case, to engage in actions which contradict these terms and violate the obligations generated by these treaties themselves. This is the uniqueness of the many human rights treaties concluded since World War II. Sovereign states through them undertake self-limitation of their own prerogatives, initiating a new regime of sovereignty. In that sense, sovereignty does not disappear. It's transformed. It's no longer understood as the supreme power of a single authority over all that is living or dead on its territory. In this new sovereignty regime, states are sovereign to the degree to which they can fulfill certain human rights obligations toward their populations. States are bound by norms of so-called use cogents, prohibiting genocide, slavery, ethnic cleansing, mass atrocities, and other crimes against humanities. Now, just a brief laundry list here, but it's important to recall uh, this uh, legal furniture of our world into mind because there is so much skepticism about these developments that we don't quite understand what we have really committed ourselves to. The best known of the major human rights arguments are the United Nations Convention after the UDHR, the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Crime of Genocide, the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, which entered into force in 1954, with only 19 state signatories, but 145 state parties. And this convention is, of course, much invoked and discussed at the moment for the current debate. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, signed in 1966, with 168 countries out of 195 being party to it as of uh, t uh, this year. The International Covenant on e Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights to which the United States is not a party, which has not had Senate ratification, but which has 164 state uh, members. Now, note the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDA, with a whopping 189 state parties um, to this convention as of today. And further, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination with 177 state parties and the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment again with 158 state parties. Undoubtedly, this new regime of sovereignty has led to many quagmires, and we cannot be naive about the difficulties of supporting human rights transnationally in the face of the political and military traps of humanitarian interventions which they have given rise to. But despite the conceptual and institutional difficulties of this dualistic system, we should not throw out the baby with the both bathwater, so to speak. While skeptical doubts about state behavior in an international system that remains beset by violence, civil wars and proxy wars cannot be said, uh, set aside, I remain convinced that something has changed profoundly in the grammar and syntax of the language of international law, sovereignty, and human rights, and that it is wrong for progressive thinkers to give up the advances achieved by international law. Let me then return to the question of the relationship between human rights and constitutional rights, which is always the argument made by democratic sovereignties 
against this language of transnational human rights. Now, very briefly, in my view, following up on arguments I've made elsewhere, human rights constitute a narrower group of claims than general moral rights. Human rights bear on human dignity and equality. They are protective of the human status as such. Human rights do not exhaust the entirety of our conceptions of justice, let alone of morality. They have their proper place in discourses of political legitimation. Such discourses presuppose moral principles in the sense that the justification of human rights always leads back to some moral principles such as human dignity, human capability, some vision of human agency. And here I agree with Martha that there is no human rights conception that does not have some moral philosophy behind it. Now, transnational human rights covenants of the kinds that I have listed preceding him articulate general principles which need contextualization and specification in the form of legal norms. States that are parties to these conventions undertake to develop certain kinds of norms. How is this legal context to be shaped? Basic human rights, it is agreed, require justiciable form. That is to say, they require embodiment and instantiation in a specific legal framework. But does this mean that these transnational human rights commit every liberal democracy, let us say, to the same constitutional rights? Obviously not. So there is a puzzle about the relationship of transnational norms and constitutional rights. And this, I think, is the most philosophical part of my paper. And I want to now try to address this problem. In negotiating the relationship between general human rights norms, as formulated in various declarations, and their concretization in the multiple legal documents of different countries, we may first invoke a distinction um, that you will recognize from Rawls. In political liberalism, Rawls gives his own version of this distinction. I'm quoting, roughly, the concept is the meaning of a term, while a particular conception includes as well the principles required to apply it. A conception includes principles and criteria for deciding which distinctions are arbitrary and when a balance between competing claims is proper, end of quote. I will not follow Rawls in identifying concept with meaning, but what is helpful in this elucidation is the dualism of concept and conception, which will help me th think through the problem of the relationship between human rights and constitutional rights. Now here, I will further resort to a distinction made by Robert Alexi, a German legal philosopher, who in, K in place of concepts and constitutions also suggests principles and norms. The binarism of concept conception can be interpreted as one of principle and norm. What is a principle? A concept of human rights is a principle of human rights that permits realization to the greatest extent possible. Principles demand realization to the greatest extent possible. Whereas conceptions of human rights require specific legal norms for their concretization and are subject to varying rules of application and interpretation. As you can see now, if one accepts my uh, pro analytical proposal, we can talk about the relationship between transnational human rights and constitutional norms, not as a mirroring relationship, nor simply as an aspirational relationship, but actually as a negotiation between principle and norm, or an interplay between concept and uh, uh, conception. So we can view the international documents as formulating core concepts of what human rights should form part of any conception of valid constitutional rights. How then can we determine a legitimate range of plurality or variation across constitutional rights? Let me give you an example. Even as fundamental principle as the moral equality of persons assumes justiciable meaning as a human right, once it is posited and interpreted by a lawgiver. 
And here, a range of legitimate variations can also always be the case. For example, while equality before the law is a fundamental principle for all societies observing the rule of law, in many societies such as Canada, Israel, and India, such equality is considered quite compatible with special immunities and entitlements that accrue to individuals in virtue of their belonging to different cultural and linguistic and religious groups. Culturally differentiated citizenship rights are compatible with the principle of equality. For societies such as the United States and France, with their more universalistic understanding of citizenship, these multicultural arrangements of citizenship would be unacceptable. At the same time, for example, just following this, in France and Germany, the norm of gender equality has led political parties to adopt various versions of the principle of parité, namely that women ought to hold public offices on 50-50 basis with men, and that for electoral office, their names ought to be placed on party tickets on an equal footing with male candidates. By contrast, in the United States, gender equality is protected by titles seven and nine, which apply only to major public institutions, such as educational institutions, hospitals, etc., which receive federal funding. Political parties do not come under the stipulations of gender equality in the United States. There is, in other words, a legally legitimate range of variation even in the interpretation and implementation of such a basic right as equality before the law. But the legitimacy of this range of variation and interpretation is crucially dependent upon the principle of self-government. My thesis is that without the right of self-government, which is exercised through proper legal and political channels, we cannot justify the range of variation in the content of constitutional rights as being legitimate. Unless a people can exercise self-government through some form of democratic channels, the translation of human rights norms into justiciable legal claims in a polity cannot be actualized. So the right of self-government is the condition for the possibility of the realization of a democratic schedule of rights. Known as the equi primordiality, it's an awkward word in German, gleich Ursprünglichkeit, this is Habermas's thesis. I'm following him here. This position goes beyond the liberal versus civic republican opposition in conceptualizing human rights. Liberals view human rights as placing limits on the publicly justifiable exercise of power. However, since Locke, the liberal tradition tends to see rights as having some definable content that precedes the political will or struggles of the demos. Rights are said to be trumps, in Ronald Dworkin's famous words, that stand outside the political process, thus constraining it. Or rights are said to depend for their interpretation upon constitutional courts alone and the practice of judicial review. Civic Republican theorists on that hand, view rights as constituents of a people's exercise of public autonomy, and they define rights with the goal of ensuring non-domination, i.e. preventing the arbitrary rule of one person over another. Constitutional courts, and in particular judicial review, are met by some civic republicans with suspicion, and parliamentary sovereignty is considered the prime expression of a people's will. A lot more could be said about this, but um, Henry would be very cross with me if I just went over. So my philosopher colleagues, please forgive me for going over much material quickly. There will be a book coming out of this, but both positions miss the essential dialectic between rights and the exercise of popular sovereignty. Without the basic rights of the person securing private autonomy and indeed non-domination, Republican sovereignty would be blind and without the exercise of collective autonomy, the rights of the persons would be empty and reside in an illusory non-political space. When we argue in politics, 
we argue about whether or not, for example, the right to privacy entails the right to request that personal information stored by online sites be erased, one of the major privacy struggles of our times. When we argue in the law, we argue about whether or not escape from clitoridectomy and forced marriages constitute sufficient grounds for the recognition of the right of asylum, which until now they had not. Argument about rights, which rights, whose rights, and exercised how are constitutive of the language of the political, they are recursively and iteratively embedded in democratic politics. They neither precede the exercise of self-government nor do they completely depend for their validity on the will of the demos. They both transcend the quotidian practice of politics and are recursively iterated in them in processes which I have called democratic iterations. In a number of works in the last decade, I have developed the concept of democratic iterations as a possible normative model with sociological traction or institutional traction to think through some of these dilemmas. By democratic iterations, I mean processes of public argument, deliberation, and exchange through which universalist rights claims are contested and contextualized, invoked and revoked, posited and positioned throughout legal and political institutions. Every iteration transforms meaning and adds to it and enriches it. Every act of iteration involves making sense of an original authoritative content in a new and different context through interpretation. Democratic citizens and residents and potentially all those affected by the normative reach of these norms must reinterpret and reappropriate human rights principles such as to give them shape as constitutional rights and if and when necessary suffuse constitutional rights with new content. Nor is it to be precluded that such constitutional iterations may themselves provide feedback loops in rendering more precise the language and intent of international human rights declarations and treaties. Democratic iterations occur through out national and transnational civil society and global public spheres in very diverse sites. In constitutional democracies, the courts are the primary authoritative sites of norm interpretation, although obviously not of their democratic iteration, since per definitionem they cannot meet democratic criteria of legitimacy. Yet, the interaction between domestic norms on the one hand and transnational human rights norms do not take place in courts alone. Increasingly in intervening in such processes are NGOs and INGOs such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch that can produce expert reports as well as mobilizing public opinion around controversial norm implementation and interpretation. A third site of interpretation emerges through the interaction of domestic, judicial, and transnational sources of norm interpretation with political opinion formation of ordinary citizens gathered in social movements as well as other associations across borders. When considered with respect to international law and democratic sovereignty, this concept of iterations helps us understand processes which Judith Resnick has also documented. She observes that treaty ratification now no longer is centered upon, quote, a singular formal moment of ratification through a monovocal state, end of quote. Increasingly, cities, states, counties, municipalities are themselves incorporating major human rights treaties into their charters. The city of San Francisco, as well as Sao Paulo, have adopted CEDAW, although, as you all know, we failed to ratify it. Portland, Oregon, has incorporated the UDHR into its own charter. These processes of what Judith Resnick calls legal seepage 
at sites below the centralized judicial authority of the state testify to the disaggregation of the national. We see affiliations that multiply at sites at which transnational judicial conversations can occur and show how even in the face of national recalcitrance, some human rights conventions such as CEDAW can create conversations across national and local boundaries. Resnick further cites how Bangladesh in 1997 withdrew reservations to CEDAW which were earlier based on the conflict between Sharia law and the convention, which still continues as one of the biggest debates um, in, this, in this domain. Jordan withdrew a similar objection to a woman's right to independent residence and domicile other than that of her husband in 2009. Sex-based differences in the military had led countries such as Australia, Austria, Germany, New Zealand, Switzerland, and Thailand to place reservations on CEDAW, many of which have since been withdrawn. Let me return then to the objections of those thinkers who wish to defend the value of democratic self-determination and who have claimed that recent developments in international law are A, to remind you, ideals of cosmopolitan elites with little traction in the life of peoples, that international law is no more than the consensually undertaken contractual commitments of states that remain the central units of jurisdiction and enforcement, and see that the principle of self-determination expresses an important value, and that legal pluralism may be the desirable middle ground between cosmopolitanism and sovereignism. I'm not saying much about legal pluralism in this paper, as you observe. I hope to have shown, or at least to have indicated, an argument that A and B are empirically false. The normative reach of international and transnational law is not limited by their conditions of origin. They are not merely fancy documents drawn up by remote elites, but actually have consequences for the empowerment of peoples around the world. Nor can they be viewed as contractual treaty obligations undertaken by sovereign states that can be abdicated at will. They certainly are at least that, but they are also much more than that, in that they bind states to a new sovereignty regime, mobilizing civil society and their own population in the name of these new norms. My struggle here has been to do justice both to the value of democratic self-determination on the one hand and legal cosmopolitanism and transnational solidarities on the, on the other. And here we return to the refugee crisis. While states and their organizations, as well as institutions such as the United Nations, have exhibited incompetence as well as cruelty in dealing with the fate of these individuals, there has been a remarkable flourishing of acts of transnational solidarity. Civil society groups, first in Germany, then elsewhere in Europe, have formed Airbnbs for refugees to come in and live with them. The Icelandic government has been urged by its own population, one of the most homogenous in Europe, to increase the number of refugees to be admitted with the argument that plurality in the long term is beneficial also for Iceland. Hungarian citizens, ashamed by the behavior of their own government toward the refugees, have lined up the roads leading from Budapest to Austria and have provided refugees with food, water, and clothing, as well as apologies. And we have all seen the cheering crowds in Munich. These are human beings showing the cosmopolitan human rights norms and solidarity with distant others are not just philosophical fictions, but ideals that move human beings. Without the 1951 Refugee Convention, without the 1948, refugee co without the 1948 Convention Against Genocide, and without a spreading of a global human rights consciousness, such actions, I think, may not have been possible. However, racist attacks against refugees en route or in their dwellings expressions of religious and national chauvinism, 
characterizing this as, quote, an Islamic onslaught against Europe, also abound. I suspect that as the refugees get settled and as the everyday challenges of living with differences become clear, there will be more racial, ethnic, and religious tensions. This is not a path strewn with rose pet petals, but a difficult path of civic learning and civic iterations. Still, democratic iterations undertaken by civil society groups will need to keep pressure on their respective governments. We also need some system of international responsibility which does not leave this problem on Europe's doorsteps alone. As we know, many refugees are not only coming from war-torn Syria, though a majority are, but also from Afghanistan, Eritrea, Iraq, and other countries. The responsibility for these refugees is global and must also weigh most heavily on all those countries who invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, namely our own country, the UK, and other members of the so-called coalition of the willing, such as Canada. It is sheer hypocrisy to pretend that this is a European problem alone when the actors directly involved in these civil wars in these countries themselves can set continents apart. We should remember this. Every drone strike in Syria causes three to four refugees in Munich. Or as Colin Powell puts it once, it is the pottery barn principle. If you break it, you own it. Our government must be confronted with its own hypocrisy in editorializing about Europe's bungling of the refugee problem while forgetting the consequences of our own actions in creating this problem. I will not even mention, because I get too angry, the way the United States has treated women and children from Central Africa in refugee camps in its own camp in, in the southern border. Let us not forget what we are doing here in this country. The United Nations needs to establish a global refugee solidarity fund into which those countries that are unwilling to take in refugees have to pay up. So that with the winter approaching, the United Nations high refugee agencies, which have their own budgets slashed, are refurbished. The International Rescue Committee needs all the support that it can get from the hypocritical governments. But above all, during the next session of the UN General Assembly, there needs to be some kind of a general debate about international guidelines for dealing with refugee and asylum claims and about the so-called distinction between political and economic refugees and what sense this makes in our world, as well as a discussion about the generalized failure in state capacities caused by civil war, climactic factors, in Africa, such as desertification and changing sea levels. The dual regime of state sovereignty and cosmopolitan human rights is a conflictual one, and the world refugee crisis is the most vivid manifestation of its paradoxes. I have suggested that there are some plausible theoretical answers to these dilemmas, all of which operate along the shared moral and political intuition which I have with Martha Nussbaum that the democratic and the transnational, the local and the cosmopolitan, are not opposed but may enhance one another through contentious interpretation and conflict. Thank you for listening. take my water. So we now have the pleasure of inviting Martha Nussbaum uh, to come up and speak briefly uh, al along in conversation with uh, Professor Ben Habib. Thank you. Well, I want to allow time for questions from the floor, so I'm not going to even attempt to make a substantive comment, but only to say that I thought that was the most 
splendid lecture, and I, I found so much that I agree with, that in due, but in due course, I, I promise you that I'll either review the book or write a response to the Thank article, you. something that, where I can express my views um, and my appreciation more, more justly. Uh, but anyway, I do want to thank you especially for the generosity of your agreeing to come here in the middle of finishing the book and in the middle of a, the start of a busy academic year and to say how, how greatly you, you've honored the, the subject of philosophy. So, so the other thing I will say, uh, and I, I want very much to thank Henry and Diana and everyone else who has made um, effort to create this Martha Nussbaum lecture, but to say that the purpose is, is in no way, in my view, to honor me, but it's really to honor philosophy, because in an association dedicated to the whole world and to a subject, uh, particularly uh, economics, which is uh, very imperialistic and is global in its nature, it's very hard for philosophy to retain a sufficient footing, particularly because the discourse of philosophy is not always as international as the discourse of economics. And uh, so, so I, uh, the, the whole aim is to have every, on as many programs as possible an exemplar of a kind of philosophical engagement with the issues of global development that is accessible, that is in dialogue with the economic uh, work that other people in the association are doing, and that is, um, you know, holds up the example of what philosophy well done can, can offer to this uh, discourse, because that's what the association in its genesis was all about. So I can't say how delighted I am to have this example of what that lectureship can be. So thank you very, very much. Um, shall I take some questions now? Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, as a philosopher coming from South America, it has been really a pleasure to listen to you in this Martha Nussbaum lecture. I just want to, to, uh, to uh, ask you to develop a little your criticism on this, on this legal pluralism developed by Jean Cohen, please. It's not so much a criticism, and thank you for picking up on that, as to say that um, the term legal pluralism does not give us much criteria for conflict adjudication. Uh, I think that legal pluralism, let me begin this way, opens up a very important discourse because there are many countries in the world where there is the law of indigenous peoples, there is the law, separate law, for example, family. In India, we know, and Martha has written about that, family law even in pluralistic societies where ethnic groups exist or you know, Jewish law that can adjudicate family and commercial affairs. So legal pluralism is an aspect of our world that has been not at all clearly examined. Right? Uh, what we are seeing now is actually an interplay between transnational agreements and particularly uh, indigenous people's rights, that if I have been following this literature, let's say in Central and South America, are going to transnational human rights to proclaim their cultural rights and so on. I have absolutely no objections, no criticisms of this, and I think it's a healthy and good process of democratic iteration. But particularly when we come to women's rights, there are some hard choices. And that's why I don't want to leave the question as legal pluralism, because as we know, um, many of these communities who want to claim their own legal autonomy do not respect universal human rights of the kinds embodied in the transnational human rights agreements. Uh, this causes a problem, I mean, not only the famous, you know, Shabano case that had been discussed, but uh, issues with indigenous peoples in Canada, 
you know, just like the whole discussion, which is a bit antiquated now, or not antiquated, I'm sorry, which is, you know, about 15 years old, the Lake Meech Accord. Or as our deceased colleague Susan Oaken used to ask, is multiculturalism bad for women? Uh, I have taken uh, a, a stance on this. I'm trying to mediate the idea with the idea of democratic iterations, transnational judicial conversations that are trying to break down this dichotomy and this opposition and seeing how reform can come into these indigenous groups. So uh, I just have not had time or chance to say that much about legal pluralism here. I do not dismiss it. I accept some part of it, but I just think we need to go farther. People are welcome to line up at the microphone uh, if you want to. But, um, Chela, it was a wonderful lecture, and there's an interesting, wonderful resonance with uh, Martha's idea of local specification of her capabilities based theory of minimal justice. Um, and, and you add, you specify, you add, provided somewhat more specific idea like that with the concept of conception and is specific, more specific in its insistence on the democratic nature of that specification. And so I have two questions about that. One is that seems to imply that you think that democracy can be derived from the core human rights. The, the unspecified human rights, and I'd be interested to hear, is that so, is that true? And, and, then, and then the other question is, what happens for those nations that aren't democratic then? How does one deal with the human rights of the people in those nations? Yes, I knew that question had to come. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, uh, is there a human right to democracy? As we know, some of our best colleagues have argue that there isn't. I believe Martha argues that there is. Uh, and uh, I may have missed some recent right, but I believe that you do. Um, why? How do we want to make this claim? And my answer is going to be the same to, to both. Obviously, um, there are decent hierarchical societies, as Rose has told us. I always say, look at the Kingdom of Morocco. It is a more or less functioning constitutional monarchy based on the rule of law that respects certain rights, etc. But unless human rights are seen by people as their own, and I'm very strict about this, unless they can also see themselves as being the authors of the rights of which they are the addressees, they are entitlements. <laughs> they are entitlements or the largesse, generosity, that can always be revoked. I mean, this seems to me to be such an absolutely minimal insight of the Republican political thought with Rousseau, uh, why are we so worried about this? Why are we so worried about making this argument? Why is it that, you know, Joshua Kahn in a series of brilliant articles has basically put forward this kind of minimalism saying, no, there is no human right to democracy. And, you know, many of you here, like myself, um, are, you know, have been uh, students of Rawls, even though, if, you know, even if we have not studied with him, influenced by his work. I think that the issue is that this linkage together of human rights with conditions of legitimate membership in the international order has messed up the argument because it seems as if when there is human rights violation, then the suspension of sovereignty comes in. And so I think that one has been reluctant to say decent hierarchical regimes are, have not achieved really fully concepts of human rights, even though the rule of law may survive in them and so on, because immediately has been this problem of humanitarian intervention, or as Joseph Raz puts the argument, we suspend the sovereignty claim. Now, I want to say this is short-circuiting us because I am against the inflation of the language of humanitarian intervention, and I only accept it under the strictest conditions of international law of proven genocide, ethnic cleansing, slavery, and crimes against humanity. Yeah? 
uh, and then the institutional quandaries. But I, I think we need to broaden and we, see, we need to see that human rights claims are fighting words. They are context transcending, they are destabilizing, they are claims raised by individuals in critique and against their, their regime. So this is making a long story very, uh, very short. And so I'm interested in the conversation with individuals, groups, and organizations in decent hierarchical societies. Just one last point. And as you know, in some of the work that I've been doing, I've looked at this um, uh, women's movements in the Muslim world, which for me is you know, one of the burning, burning arenas you know, of conversation. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, in the context of uh, human rights and political sovereignty, I have this specific question. Uh, I come from a country which has the, uh, that is India, which has the dubious distinction of the largest arm importer in the world. Which has the what? Which is the largest arms importer of the world. Uh, well, I mean, India is importing means there must, and Pakistan is also importing, and there are a large number of countries which import arms. That means there are countries which are producing arms more than what they need. And if you look at the list of exporters, among the top six exporters, we find the five permanent Security Council UN members. So as permanent Security Council members, the mandate is to go for a more peaceful world, but that you know, mandate doesn't coincide with the defense and the commerce interest they have with the arms export. So what I'm wondering is the concept of government, what we could brought up to the stage of a country or a nation, national level, why could we not bring it to the level of the world and have something like a world government, not, at a, not as a UN system which is partial? And then probably the issues you are highlighting through your lecture would be more e easier to solve because uh, that would have the right mandate of uh, you know people's uh, voices and people's rights enshrined to that government, which can sort of delegate its responsibility for the welfare of the world. Why, why that has not happened? That's my question. Uh, fair enough. I think that I, you know, I myself ask myself the the question. I speak about porous borders. Why not a world without borders? Uh, why try to keep you know this sort of unstable and very conflictual system um, uh, at work? We know, we know um, that the UN system needs reform. We also know that the UN Charter has made it very difficult for itself to be reformed. Uh, we are at this critical moment when the Security Council, whose membership was determined according to the order of you know, the Cold War, is no longer relevant. There is absolutely no excuse for not having countries like Brazil, India, Germany, at least, on the Security Council, according to some criteria. I agree with you about all that. I mean, this is going to be a long drawn out struggle, but I sort of believe in the human capacity to solve problems. I mean, some people say that's it, the treaty, the charter really does not pr permit reform and so on, we just, you know, we just give up. Now, the question about world government. I guess um, I am, um, <laughs> um, very susceptible to the concern that has been voiced by everybody beginning from Aristotle to Kant to Hannah Arendt that um, a democratic government is somehow bound up with the question of territorial size, almost, like this is an antiquated, it's, it's an old, it's an ancient, ancient kind of argument. But that's why you hear language about world governance rather than government, uh, because um, we don't quite know that a non-despotic form of world government is possible. What I think is happening and needs to happen and we need to move further and further on this, and you heard me say this, 
is some form of world federationalism. We're going to have to move to, towards, towards that. And I think that here, well, I'm going on a little too long, but you know, I've been you know, really impressed by rereading some of Madison on these questions. They had it right. The only answer to the problem of despotic government when the problems require expansion of governmental power is working on this notion of federalism and federationalism. So that's where we should you know, keep pushing. And that's one reason why I'm looking at this somehow very utopian seeming global constitutionalism discussion because there are insights there. Thank you. I have just one very simple question, which is that I would love to hear you speak a little bit about China, uh, particularly given um, their anger at you know, being, having the topic of human rights brought up. Um, so in this, you know, um, is there a, a way that could, is, is there, would be there a way to be more persuasive, I guess, or? Um, you know, um, human rights has become, for so many people, a tired concept. And for me, it isn't. And obviously, I'm trying to, I'm not sure that I need to convince you all. But there is a difference between the invocation of this concept as a foreign policy Kajalan tool and its invocation by people in, who did in Tiananmen Square, by dissidents, by civil society organizations, and so on. It is really true that this language gets caught in rivalries between East and West, North and South, and it empties itself out of context. And, and this for us is a real, is a real issue. Um, so I'm not uh, you know, a, China, uh, a China expert, but I um, also believe that the transformations of these regimes so far have also been so incredible. I mean, this is communism that has reinvented state capitalism. And, uh, you know, uh, there's just such, such uh, fantastic developments there that I believe that sooner or later, you know, this argument may, you know, that it's not irrelevant, that we have to keep, we have to keep pushing, uh, pushing at it. In the little corners that we find, uh, we have to. Oh, there's oh, Dean. Sorry, we're, we're just out of time, Dean. I'm sorry. But me, at least we can hear the question. But, but at least you know each other. Well, yes, you, we do. You want to hear the question? Yes. Okay, and we, we can want, talk afterwards. Okay, the speaker wants to hear the question. Uh, it's a good quickly. thing that I'm just asking the question and not looking for an answer right in this short time because the question is a rather broad one. So uh, you just mentioned of democratic governance rather than government. And of course, we are familiar with your philosophy on that, and of course we look forward to your forthcoming book, but uh, you are talking about uh, democratic iteration uh, as sort of the, uh, as mitigating the tension between the two polarities. Now, we know of Amartya Sen's idea of uh, democratic uh, public reason, and he has a sense of, or a conception of global justice. We would like to find out what would be, of course not, this is the right now, not the time, your uh, conception of global justice in the form of that global governance, because a lot depends on that, the on the prospect and success of the democratic iteration there. That Wonderful. Was well, well, Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll, I shall take that under advisement. <laughs> we'll, have we'll have Professor Benaby back for another lecture to cover that topic, but uh, please let's give another warm round of applause to Thank Professor Benaby.